The year is about 2008, and finally, it's the end of the collectible miniatures era. Well, just about anyway. <laughs> but that didn't stop Upper Deck from trying to cash in. Today's classic game commentary is all about World of Warcraft miniatures by Upper Deck Entertainment. Now, presumably, this game was trying to bring the feel of WoW PvP to the tabletop, and I say presumably because, well, I've never actually played World of Warcraft. It's just kind of how things worked out. However, unlike some of the other kind of major franchises that had tabletop miniature tie-ins back during this time period, this one actually had a few clever tricks to its game. Before we get to that point though, let's talk about the miniatures. Now, World of Warcraft miniatures had pre-assembled, pre-painted miniatures, and they were pretty much on par with what you had from that era of the late 2000s. You had characters doing the little Matrix moves. You had some demon guy rocking out to Satan. And then there was this orc over here who, frankly, the way he's painted with essentially no contrast in his face, kind of looks like a sick zombie. <laughs> I must be honest with you, you didn't buy these games because the miniatures were amazingly painted. They were adequate to get you through the gameplay. One thing that is a little bit different about these miniatures is they had these bases called U-Bases, that was a trademark term at the time, and they would clip on to the bottom and that's how you do some of the stat tracking for your miniature. This was a Warband scale game. So in general, your list would have like three to five characters on them, but you could scale that up a little bit if you wanted to. And there were also rules for this 1v1 superhero thing where you took one character and decked it out with a bunch of special abilities and just beat the crap out of each other. <laughs> that probably could have been fun, but I never actually played that mode. All the characters in your warband would come from one faction, which of course those were the Alliance, the Horde, and Unaligned Monsters. And when it came to Warband construction, this is where we find one of the game's more interesting aspects of its rules. For most of the scenarios, you didn't actually build a list to a certain point value like you generally do for most tabletop miniatures games. However, every unit in the game did have a point value assigned to it. This was because for most of the scenarios, what you had to do to win the game was score a number of points equal to the total value of your Warband. Therefore, if you took a list of several large, powerful characters, you'd have to score more points to win than if you chose a list with several smaller or weaker characters. So much of the gameplay of World of Warcraft miniatures was fairly standard for what you'd expect from a tabletop miniatures game. You had a stat card for each of the characters, which had all the information you need to use them. You had attacks up here. Over here, you had defense against physical attacks, defense against magic, their health, and then finally there's a set of special rules which altered how that character played, changed major rules, and also how it could interact with other characters in different ways. I mentioned something a little bit ago about a U-Base. Now this is a click style base which allows you to track certain aspects of the miniature. Behind the miniature you had a little window which showed how much health the character had remaining so you could turn this around and that would then either reduce the health and the took damage or you could heal them up and get some health back. Now on the side of the base, you had something called a personal clock. This particular aspect of the game was probably one of its most interesting and most unique mechanics. For the most part, this game did not follow a standard you go, I go format, where you know you would move a miniature, I move a miniature, or some combination of that. Instead, each game round was broken down into 10 individual ticks. And at the top of the mat here, you would have a way of tracking which tick you're on for that given round. And when the tick that you were on matched the number of the personal clock of a character, that character would be able to act. When characters did an attack, that would cost them a certain number of ticks of time, and you would have to advance their personal clock that many ticks, and therefore there would be a certain amount of delay from the current activation of tick, it keeps using that word, but that's the official terminology for the game, until they could actually act again. So you have situations where one character may be able to make a powerful attack every so often, 
where other characters would be able to make weaker attacks but much more often. And balancing this whole tick delay versus the type of attack or activation or whatever ability you're going to use was a major part of managing your forces. So gameplay would occur in some sort of map sheet, which you're seeing right here comes from the basic starter sets. You would have spawn points, little graveyard areas. There were control points marked by VP and then other sort of terrain that would affect the game in different ways. This is a double-sided map that had different terrain on both sides. And if you had the deluxe edition, you have a little bit of a nicer board. In fact, it was a lot nicer board with one side being completely blank where you could use different tokens included with the game to create your own battlefield. The objectives of the battle would vary a little bit from kind of scenario to scenario, but for the most part involved killing enemy characters and also scoring points by controlling those victory point locations. Since the stats of the characters were fixed because they were all on these stat cards here, the one way you could customize your characters in your warband were there's something called action bar cards. Now in general, characters would get two of these per game, but there were other modes where I mentioned earlier that superhero one versus one mode where you could take more or you could choose not to use them all together. What they did is they granted characters new attacks, new abilities. Uh, some cases we have some pets in here too that could tag along with the characters or some of them were like shapeshifters who could transform into different forms and other sorts of fun, crazy things that would interrupt the flow of the gameplay to react to other actions, occur at certain times. It made the game a little bit more interesting, basically. Um, now, each of the action bar cards were limited in one way or another by either a certain class or some of them were tied to a more powerful, unique named character. Now, when you're building your warband, these cards did not actually add on to the point value of your warband. Instead, their cost was factored in with their tick cost up here in the corner. When they were used, this would cause the personal clock of that character to advance a certain amount of ticks, and of course that would prevent them from acting again until a little bit later on in the turn. So the more powerful cards had a longer delay, where the weaker cards or some of the passive abilities had a zero delay. So now it's time for my opinion of this game back when it was out almost 14 years ago. Ugh. I try not to think about how old I'm getting. And normally you're thinking, is he going to trash this game because it's an old collectible miniatures game? And the answer to that is no. This is one of the better games from that collectible era where that seemed to be all the rage. I am so glad that's mostly gone. I am so glad. I think I said that every time I talk about collectible miniatures games. But... This game here, because of that personal clock mechanic, which kind of staggered activations in strange ways and made you think about when you actually wanted to activate your character and which powers to take, it made the game play quite a bit different than what you'd expect for a typical tabletop miniatures game. And as a bonus, it gave Ryan PTSD. This is Ruby Gem Sparkle. <laughs> I don't know why he hates his character, but he hates his character. I think she has some kind of crazy powerful magic ability to drive him nutty. I, I have to look at her car to see what she had. Um, the only real downside to this game is that since it was so focused on that PvP experience from computer multiplayer games that it kind of locked itself into that format. Now if you have the deluxe box set, which is the bigger box I've been showing off here, there are more scenarios, so it's not purely a standard PvP deathmatch fest. But this game does lack the flexibility of, you know, say like a Warhammer or Hero Escape or even Mech Warrior for that matter, because you're kind of tied to that small hex map. Um, there are ways you can get around that, but it's not as easy as you would with some of the other games. And as for, you know, I can't comment if a World of Warcraft fan would enjoy this game or not. I assume that most of the characters are here from the game, you'd recognize them, including some famous meme things, like I believe Leroy Jenkins is a character in the game, I don't have him, but he is a character if you wanted to try to track his miniature down somewhere. Um, but you know, like I said, I never played World of Warcraft, and I enjoyed this game, so there's no reason to even have to like look past this game if you're not a big fan of World of Warcraft. It frankly doesn't really matter for the fact of the gameplay. It's just the license the game used. It's a fun little miniature skirmish game. So if you like that kind of stuff, I would definitely try to see if you could find a copy of it and check it out. It is a fairly simple game and it could be a good introduction to some of the more complex tabletop miniature games that are out there today. 
So a final few things to note if you are looking to pick up some copies of the game on the secondary market. I was looking around the internet, both on eBay and some other sites, and they still sell this. There's still some amount of quantity out there here in the year 2022. And there are a few notes you need to know though. These U-bases, which snap off the miniatures, they're not included for the most part with the miniatures. They came in the starter sets, and there might have been some sort of like add-on thing where it was like a utility pack or something where you get more of these. So just keep that in mind. You're going to have to get at least a starter or get a hold of some of these bases. Now, each of the factions have their own base. So this kind of purplish was Alliance, red was Horde, and green was Monster. And the only differences between them are the colors in the base and the little faction icon. So you don't really have to use... A, you know, a certain faction icon for certain characters for any particular reason. In fact, it might be a good idea to have one player use red bases, one player use blue bases. <laughs> you know, just to keep things a little bit more clearer on the tabletop. Now, there were two different types of starter sets. There's a deluxe box set and the standard box set. Now, the deluxe box set had more characters in it and therefore more U bases. It also had a much nicer board. I've showed this off earlier. It had the nice cardstock board versus the basic set, which just had a paper mat. And also the cardstock board had some uh, tokens to go with it for creating your own custom battlefield. And that was in the deluxe set. And you could find a way to combine two of these deluxe boards together to make one big epic battlefield. So if you had you and your friend had a deluxe starter set, you could do that. And the other advantage to having the deluxe starter set is you got a little bit nicer rule book. So the small guy over here, this is the standard one, and this is the deluxe one. The deluxe one had more content to it, had some FAQs in it. It also had a handful of scenarios to the rule book where this guy doesn't have that. So the deluxe set is definitely a little bit better of an option if you're looking to get into the game. I believe you can still find some of those, but the other starter sets are available as well. Well, that brings us to the end of another classic game commentary here on the Tabletop Battlefield. I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield. I want to thank you guys all for watching. I've done a few more videos in this series talking about Mech Warrior Dark Age, which was crazy popular for some reason, but that's awesome. And of course, BattleBots, the kickbot battle game dice something time, and it was crap. No one cares. <laughs> but I got plenty more of these old games to dig up and pull out. I got StarCraft still sitting around somewhere, Dust Tactics. I, I don't know if that game is actually technically classic or not. That It may still actually be available. But I have the original... I have an old starter set for it. I don't know if it's the original starter set. I don't remember what edition I have of it. But there's some other fun stuff I've got we'll take a look at on this series because I know that people do enjoy some of these looks at old classic games. So until next time, thanks for watching.